We ready? Yes, no? Yeah. Hannah's ready? Nice. Uh, for the few of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Corey Waters, and uh, this is Vegan Series. Thank you for coming. Uh, Vegan Series is um, a speaker series that seeks to stimulate interactions about veganism and about the liberation of all sentient beings. Um, I employed the term series because I want for people to realize that there's always more to come. Um, I already have three events scheduled beyond this event for the series. Um, the next one is scheduled for November 11th. Um, and that will feature Aviva Shamsky, who is a professor of history at Salem State University, uh, which is my alma mater. Um, it's now called, it used to be called Salem State University now. No, it used to be called Salem State College, now it's Salem State University. Um, and the topic of that event will be um, immigrant rights. Um, I conduct the series, at least for tonight, through Animal Activists of Philly and the Temple Vegan Action Network, or TVAN. Um, you can learn more about Animal Activists of Philly by joining our meetup site at meetup.com. Uh, we have several campaigns, um, including a series of upcoming protests um, at the Philadelphia Zoo and um, at the Universal Circus in Fairmont Park. Um, these are peaceful protests that um, very effectively bring a presence to animal rights. So I highly encourage all of you to participate. Um, animal Access Philly also has a Facebook page. Um, you can like that page, but if you're interested, first and foremost, um, you should join the meetup group. Um, you can find that just by Googling Animal Access of Philly or just going to meetup.com and searching for the group name. Um, you can learn more about TVAN by joining our listserv or our Facebook group. Um, we regularly table, we do a sign campaign, and just underway is a residence life initiative that involves exposing um, students um, who live on campus to veganism and to vegan food options. Um, we have a small, um, dedicated group of advocates um, but we need more people, um, so if you're interested in advocating veganism on this campus, um, if you are interested in just learning about veganism, even if you're not vegan, um, TVAN is an ideal venue for you, so come check it out. So if you want to um, learn more about Animal Activists of Philly or TVAN, um, touch base with me after the event and I can inform you of what you need to know. Um, as for tonight, we have Temple's um, top vegan with us. We had a competition and he went out. Um, this is uh, Dr. Daniel Featherston, who is a professor of English here at Temple. He teaches, um, among other courses, an eco-literature course that focuses on human-animal community. And he's also the new editor of the Lexington Press Critical Animal Studies book series. Did you get that right? Yeah. Nice, nice. Um, tonight's topic is the invisibility of animals. Um, Dan will open with a lecture and then a discussion involving you and your questions and your comments will commence. Um, one of my goals for this series is to connect um, theory and practice. So tonight we'll be talking about theory, we'll be talking about intersectionality, we'll be talking about how animals, human as well as non-human animals, are rendered invisible. But ultimately what I want to address is what are we going to do about it. Um, so if we do not address that question, um, during the first frame of the discussion or during Dan's lecture, um, I will raise that point um, later on. Um, we have samples of pizza from Blackbird Pizza. If you haven't had pizza yet, please try some pizza. Um, the pizza was purchased with a Veg Fund grant. Uh, Veg Fund has supported um, our events consistently, and for that I'm very grateful. So, Dan. Thanks, Corey. Well, thanks for coming out. Um, when Corey asked me to do this talk, um, or to do a talk for uh, the T-Band series, I was thinking about um, some issues that pertain to animal advocacy, and I thought about talking about the invisibility of animals, um, because anyone who's done any animal advocacy, or even just you know anyone in general, I think um, there are many ways when you think about it, animals are rendered invisible um, in our world. And um, so what I want to do tonight is, is just visit some of those ways in which animals are made invisible and, uh, and then open it up for discussion. Um, so the way it's framed here, different types of invisibility. Some are hiding, some animals are hiding, some animals are hidden, and finally some animals are on your plate. Um, the picture up here is uh, a little female house sparrow. I was teaching in Center City over the summer. Temple, and um, I was running to class in the rain, 
and uh, I ran across the street and I saw something that looked like a piece of paper fluttering in the sidewalk, kind of wedged between two slabs of sidewalk. And then I realized it, it wasn't a piece of paper, it was something organic, it was something maybe alive. And you've probably all seen uh, bird wings on the highway, or if a bird smashed, uh, you know, the wind blows. And so I thought maybe it was, <coughs> excuse me, a flat, uh, smashed bird just with its wing blowing the wind. I went over and, and picked her up, and it turned out to be this drenched um, little female house sparrow, and then that's her there. So I took her to class, I had to teach with one hand, I held her, um, she dried during the course of the class. Um, I also work at the Schuylkill Wildlife Rehab Clinic, so they helped me uh, rehab her and she was re-released. But I put her up here because... Um, uh, oh, and her wing's fine too, by the way. But I put her up here because um, so many people probably walk by her <clears throat> during the course of the day. I don't know how long she'd been there, but she's so drenched I thought she was a nestling or a fledgling. Um, but the important thing that I want, you know, among other things to take away is how, you know, the question of how to make animals visible and, you know, what can we do to facilitate that. Um, John Berger's Why I Look at Animals, amazing I say it's really been a touchstone for me um, in my own work as a scholar, as an advocate uh, in, in discussing animals. And, and by the way, when I say animals, I'm meaning non-human animals. Um, but uh, this is a quote from Berger's Why I Look at Animals. That look between animal and man, which may have played a crucial role in the development of human society, and with which, in any case, all men had always lived until less than a century ago, has been extinguished. So the notion that we're not even seeing animals anymore. And it gets, it's complex, his, his ideas of, uh, of looking at animals. Um, and my, my remark to that, I do think that the look, the, the communication visually with animals is and has been disappearing for a long time. But as I say here, but the extinguishing of the look between man and animal predates capitalism. Capitalism merely accelerated the invisibility of the animal. And um, this is one of the oldest surviving <coughs> cultural artifacts we have as human beings from the caves of Lascaux, where the very first, um, the very first subject matter in the arts in human, hi human history, now who knows before that, um, the Paleolithic cave art uh, involved animals. And um, as you see here, this has been interpreted in a variety of ways, but a lance in, um, impaling the animal, his entrails um, coming out. So I think that our history with animals has been at best ambivalent, and it's not been, as Berger would say, this romantic past where animals were these magical creatures and we were benign. Uh, our relationship with them, and then capitalism comes along, and suddenly, uh, suddenly animals start disappearing or tr are treated differently. Nonetheless, I do think capitalism plays a part. Maybe that's something we could talk about uh, as we go along. Hannah Arendt, one of my favorite uh, philosophers, um, in her book *The Human Condition*, everything that appears in public can be seen and heard by everybody. And that's such a profound idea in the history of, at least in Western civilization, of the public sphere, just like this is a public sphere, that to be seen and heard are the two sort of modalities of, um, of being a public figure. And maybe, this kind of dates me, but maybe you've heard that children should be seen and not heard. Um, an example of children being outside the public sphere, being pushed out of, out of the public sphere. Um, appearance, something that is being seen and heard by others as well as by ourselves, constitutes reality. Compared with the reality which comes from being seen and heard, even the greatest forces of intimate life lead an uncertain, shadowy kind of existence unless and until they are transformed, deprivatized, and de-individualized. And so that's what I want to talk about too, is if it's the case that animals are rendered invisible, then what are the political, social consequences? What are the consequences for animals um, when they are hidden from the public sphere? 
So how are animals invisible? And I wanted to frame things, you know, hiding, hidden, and uh, on your plate, uh, and touch upon a different, you know, animals is vast, right? There are these different taxonomies, categories, um, but, but visit a few of these, um, especially I was thinking about here on campus, animals um, that, we, um, that we see or don't see. So how are animals invisible? So some are hiding. I would call this a kind of natural invisibility. Um, and these are actually all animals that I've seen on campus, and maybe you guys have too. Um, sadly, the, bro the little brown bat was probably ill, uh, but I saw, I saw a little brown bat a couple years ago. Opossum, and of course raccoons. Um, as nocturnal animals, maybe uh, you don't see them very often. Um, or just, you know, at dusk and later. But there's that sort of invisibility that's uh, in the interest of the animal. And uh, here are a couple more examples. I don't know if any of you know, it's either Libby or Paley, who actually lives around the corner um, in the little garden between the library and Tuttleman. And I worked with a lot of other people on campus to get her, to get the two of them um, spayed and returned, trap, neuter, and release um, to that environment. But they're um, very interested in invisibility as well, and hiding. Of course, you know, I just took this a couple days ago at, um, on campus near the lunch trucks on the right. And those, you, they're so invisible, maybe you can't see them, or maybe my, my, my camera and my cell phone is really bad, or a combination. But that's uh, a clutch of sparrows here that are eating, and how they merge into the environment with their um, with the house sparrows, with their um, coloration of their feathers, as that changes. I'd also call this hypervisibility as a form of invisibility. And what I mean by that is that animals uh, that you see so frequently that they just sort of disappear. And there's where invisibility is manufactured from human perception, right? Uh, and so, uh, one of the cutest squirrels I've ever seen. <laughs> That's a little baby squirrel. There's Memo, the house sparrow again, and uh, a blue bar rock dove. All very common on campus. And I know so many, you know, a lot of times people think, uh, they look at an animal, it's like, oh, you've seen one, you've seen them all. There's another squirrel, there's another sparrow. And I think one important thing about making visible is making individual, right? So you interact and you look at each individual being human, or non-human as, as a particular, and not just a generalization. There's also um, over our heads an invisibility. Right now we're in the middle of the fall migration, and uh, we are actually in the Atlantic Flyway right here. The, the, fly, the, the flight corridor for migratory birds goes right over Philadelphia. And I've worked with Audubon and, and people at Temple and others to um, <clears throat> try to get the bird strikes down on campus. You, maybe when have you been walking around recently, you're seeing a lot of dead birds. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they're invisible what, as well. You walk by a dead bird and most people, it's just, you know, it's just a, it's invisible, right? So, um, so that's another form of invisibility that, um, this here is a black and white warbler that I found uh, outside of the uh, Beasley School of Law just yesterday, um, migrating. You could tell from the impact on his face, on his beak, that uh, he had blunt force trauma from most likely hitting a, a window on campus. Um, just, you know, I'll go through this quickly, but ongo ongoing monitoring surveys estimate that 1,000 to 1,500 birds collide with buildings on Temple's campus each year. Uh, I won't go through the list here, but these are, this is just a brief list of some of the birds that are in our environment. And, um, you know, of course there are some people that, that are interested in birds, but look up versus looking down or something. But, um, again, it's an act of looking and making visible and um, an education too, right, is, a, is an act of visibility, of making visible. Um, so moving from natural invisibility to what I would call a cultural invisibility or institutional invisibility is um, some are hidden, uh, a culture of invisibility. 
I love this stenciled um, pigeon. Has anybody seen this? Um, I think it's on Pollock Walk. It's, um, I'm a big, I do pigeon uh, rescue work too. I, I love pigeons. Um, and Hannah just got, gave me a pigeon the other day. Um, <laughs> but that's what that is. Uh, so moving into institutional invisibility. Um, here at Tempo, um, on our, our campuses, we have lab animals. And these are animals that are um, concealed from the public. Going back to that notion that Rent talks about, to be public and to have that identity beyond just the private, which I, I forgot to mention, but historically, and many of you know this, but uh, those who are constituted as outside the public sphere, um, slaves, women, uh, you know, historically different groups of people, but also animals. And so these animals, um, these are actually some rats, uh, this isn't quite accurate, these are Arcadia rats that I went on a rat uh, pickup with uh, a friend of mine, and uh, these, these uh, rats were placed in homes, but they were uh, used in experiments. And the government shutdown has affected my PowerPoint <laughs> because uh, the USDA website, if you, if you type it in, uh, it just says, due to the government shutdown, the USDA website's not available. But here's, I was able to dig around and find a 2009 report from Temple, uh, the Temple Research Facility Report of, and it just gives you an idea, again, this is 2009, but the different types of animals that were experimented on at Temple including dogs, cats, guinea pigs, rabbits, sheep, and pigs. Uh, I heard once, I don't know, you know, I don't have anything um, to back this up, but a couple of students told me once that they also uh, use rock doves or pigeons. Um, the Animal Welfare Act excludes rats, mice, birds, farm animals, and all cold-blooded animals. So these legally don't have to be reported, which is another form of invisibility. And then finally, the, the, uh, the third type of invisibility I wanted to talk about is uh, some are on your plate, the, the food animal as invisible. When I teach, I often ask my students, um, what, what animal did you see today? What animals have you seen today? And in the four years I've been asking that, not once has a student mentioned the animals on their plate. So that's a profound form of invisibility, right, where there's a disconnect uh, between eating animals and seeing animals, right? Um, they're rendered invisible, and in a whole variety of ways. I really think, um, not to create a hierarchy of sorts, but I think that farmed animals are one of the most important categories of animals that need uh, more advocacy, and there are a lot of groups that are, that are you know, trending in this, in this direction. Uh, networks and, and organizations, um, but that's something we don't think about often. That that uh, the, the farmed animal, and you know, we could parse this out in so many ways. But um, from my perspective as a teacher, I would love to to bring a farmed animal into the classroom, or to go to a, uh, a farmed animal sanctuary. Um, maybe that's something I'll do in the future. But for the most part, you have like on one hand the hyper visibility, arguably of companion animals, and then the hyper-invisibility of farmed animals. Um, actually, the cat that I showed you earlier, when I, was t when I took her to the TNR clinic at the Pennsylvania SPCA, the, uh, the intake person was sitting in the, in the, in the cube where the, where the cats go for surgery, and he's uh, eating a, an egg and, egg and bacon McMuffin. And, you know, there, there are so many examples like this of what does it mean, right? Not to, not to say I'm judging it right now or, or saying something, but, it, but just to stop and think. On the one hand, this guy's helping this cat, and literally on the other hand, he's holding these you know, body parts of animals um, and a whole composite in that, in that muffin of, of different types of animals, different body parts, and so on. So there's this profound disconnect ethically, uh, and, and you know, the best that can be said about it is a profound uh, ambivalence about, um, about animals and visibility.
So, <clears throat> some statistics from 2009, uh, land animals killed, and this is only in the U.S., and only what's been documented. So, you can extrapolate from that that this is a very conservative estimate from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In the U.S., 8.27 billion land animals killed for, US, uh, for food in the U.S. And another profound invisible section of the animal world is uh, aquaculture and, and farming the oceans and farming sea animals. 51 billion uh, killed for food in the U.S. And when I say but, numbers, as a poet friend of mine once said, numbers are numbing, right? Can, can any of you conceive of uh, five billion? I, I know I can. The, my head falls apart. Um, it's just, it's staggering. Um, and how do you make that visible? How do you articulate that? How do you speak it? How do you visualize it? Um, you know, that's a, that's a very important question, I think, that needs to be uh, looked at. And language is numbing. Language can be numbing as well. Uh, as I say here, just as mice, rats, birds, and other animals are excluded from the Animal Welfare Act, the majority of animals killed for food in the U.S., the majority are excluded from the Humane Slaughter Act, including fish, chickens, and rabbits. So legal blindness in the sense that, well, don't we have acts that take care of these animals and ensure their welfare? Um, and this is not to say at all that it would suddenly be ethical if, you know, we abided by these, uh, these welfare acts and such. But these animals, legally speaking, are invisible. They do not exist. They do not <coughs> exist as legally defined animals. Um, and, interesting enough, you know, the Humane Slaughter Act, chickens, a massive amount of of, of, accounts for the massive amount of, of slaughter, no regulation uh, based on the Humane Slaughter Act, nor with fish and, and rabbits. Other exemptions, uh, ritual slaughter is exempted. So nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prohibit, abridge, or in any way hinder the religious freedom of any person or group, notwithstanding any other provision of this chapter in order to protect freedom of religion, ritual slaughter, and the handling of other or other preparation of livestock for ritual slaughter are exempted from the terms of this chapter. I don't know if any of you have seen somebody uh, like walking a goat down Broad Street and wondered what, what's that about, right? Slaughter. Um, a couple, few years ago, uh, there were uh, chicken body parts found around temples, uh, on the outskirts of Temple's campus. Um, and that was uh, traced to uh, voodoo practices, which, you know, under this ritual slaughter, would be protected as well. Um, so there are all these exceptions, um, and they they really they really don't do much. And then even if you know you say, well, what do they do? That's that we could have that discussion as well. Um, so how is invisibility powerful? What's the power of invisibility? Um, quote here. Institutional cruelty does everything it can to conceal the fact that it is destroying its victims. And in doing this, it keeps its spectators from feeling disgust and from being confused by the paradox of trying to justify the unjustifiable, of trying to praise the smashing of the weak. And, you know, that, that's such a rich area of, of um, discussion as well, is how do institutions, governments, and so forth, how do they um, manufacture power and maintain power by concealing uh, and, uh, and hiding information, bodies, uh, and so forth? It's a, it's, a, it's a tool that's been you know, used, obviously, an ancient tool, but um, that's one way that, that uh, invisibility is powerful. And back to Hannah Arendt, the most intense feeling we know of, intense to the point of blotting out all of their experiences, namely the experience of great bodily pain, is at the same time the most private and least communicable of all. So going back to the model of the private sphere and the public sphere, the public is a place where we are seen and we talk. But when you go to the private sphere, I mean, think about this for a minute. When somebody 
um, even somebody who's really close to you, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, whoever, and they stub their toe or something, right? You can imagine that pain, but you can't experience it. Um, and so that, obviously that goes across the species boundary. We, we can't experience directly the pain of another human being, nor the pain of another non-human being. Um, so given that fact, what do we do? What do we have at our disposal? Human to human, we have so many different tools and so much more work to be done, of course. Uh, but with animals, it gets complicated, right? In the sense of being seen, in the sense of communication, expression of pain. Um, and a lot of times I'll talk to people about like their dog and say, well, I know my dog, if I step on her foot and she screams, that she's experiencing pain, right? Um, but that same, that same uh, logic won't be applied to any animals outside companion animals or the case of an of a individual dog. Um, Race privatists, the, the public, or the private thing rather. So privacy is privation. Or you could think of it as a deprivation of sorts. Uh, the private sphere, and, and, and the Latin privatus means property. And here I'm talking about the animal as property, as object status, and on a legal level, um, this is reflected in, uh, for example, you know, if, if you, you kill your neighbor's dog, um, you're fine. So it's a sense that the animal is your property, right? Um, and with property status, that disallows um, so much, right? Uh, so much acknowledgement, so much visibility. So um, in the private sphere and in that deprivation, it's for animals uh, deprived of being seen and, and being heard. Other forms of invisibility, uh, ag-gag and anti-whistleblower laws. Um, so now here in 2002, the American Legislative Exchange Council drafted the Animal and Ecological Terrorism Act, a model law for distribution to lobbyists and state lawmakers across the nation. The model bill prohibited, quote, entering an animal or research facility to take pictures by photograph, video camera, or other means with the intent to commit criminal activities or defame, defame the facility or its owner. It has also created a terrorist registry for those convicted under the law. So on a legal front, it's worth asking, right? Um, the, the conditions of factory farms um, and the, our right as uh, citizens and consumers to know what's going on. Um, but again, it's, an, it's, it's um, endorsing this notion of invisibility. It's making animals more and more invisible. Um, in particular here, not, well, not just factory farming, but research labs and so forth. Um, I want to talk about, uh, briefly, um, Carol Adams' notion of the absent referent, too, which some of you may be familiar with already. Um, I found it to be very useful in thinking about animals. Um, and she talks about the absent referent as manifest in three different ways, the literal, the definitional, and the metaphorical. And Adam says in The Sexual Politics of Meat, uh, through butchering, animals become absent reference. Animals in name and body are made absent as animals for meat to exist. Animals' lives precede and enable the existence of meat. If animals are alive, they cannot be meat. Thus, a dead body replaces the live animal. Without animals, there would be no meat eating, yet they are absent from the act of eating meat because they have been transformed into food. And maybe another thing worth <laughs> thinking about or talking about, uh, the, 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 um, I'm blank on the name of it, but the, um, is it in vitro, the, grow, the lab meat that was recently unveiled a few months ago. Beyond meat? Yeah, in vitro meat, that's right. And, and uh, the ethical implications of that, and whether you know, it, it still interfaces or not with uh, Adam's definition of, of literal, the literal absent referent. Then there's definitional. When we eat animals, we change the way we talk about them. For instance, we no longer talk about baby animals. 
but about veal or lamb. So when you, you know, you start thinking about this and you start hearing it. It's kind of like if you buy a red car, then suddenly you see red cars everywhere. But you, uh, you, it makes visible the discourse on animals and how we talk about animals, how we think about them. Um, and so with definitions, they're made invisible as well or absent. Finally, metaphorical, as the absent referent becomes metaphor, its meaning is lifted to a quote-unquote higher or more imaginative function than its own existence might merit or reveal. An example of this is when rape victims or battered women say, I felt like a piece of meat. In this example, meat's meaning does not refer to itself, but to how a woman victimized by male violence felt. That meat is functioning as an absent referent is evident when we push the meaning of the metaphor. One cannot truly feel like a piece of meat. Teresa de la Reta's comments, no one can really see oneself as an inert object or a, a sightless body. And no one can really feel like a piece of meat because meat, by definition, is something violently deprived of all feeling. The use of the phrase feeling like a piece of meat occurs within a metaphoric language, uh, system of language. Uh, the animals have become absent reference whose fate is transmuted into a metaphor for someone else's existence or fate. Metaphorically, the absent referent can be anything whose original meaning is undercut as it is absorbed into a different hierarchy of meaning. In this case, the original meaning of animal's fate is absorbed into a human-centered hierarchy. Specifically in regard to rape victims and battered women, the death experience of animals acts to illustrate the lived experience of women. And teaching in the English department, I teach um, some literature courses, and of course we talk a lot about metaphor, uh, which means uh, etymologically a, a bearing a cross. So you're, you're bear, and there's maybe a, a Catholic pun in bearing a cross, right? But, but there's this bearing a cross of one, from one thing to another. And, um, and in this, this, or this lifting up into the human realm, um, the, the animal's death, um, the animal's experience is just used as a, as a vehicle to better illuminate the, the human condition. Um, and so, um, you know, another example, I, I, I read, I've, I've been reading some uh, Holocaust testimony recently. And a lot of the survivors talk about we were herded, herded like cattle. We were um, treated like animals. Um, again, that's to say um, that the animal's experience is used to illuminate the human experience. Um, but it's interesting, right? I, it was so horrific that I was treated like an animal. And that says a lot, I think, about, uh, in language, uh, about our values and our value system. Um, so Adams, the final thing I want to say about the, the sexual politics we here, the absent referent is both there and not there. And it's important. It's, it, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, and I think of animals oftentimes like that. They're almost like ghostly figures that move on the boundaries of our lives, for, for the most part, uh, are they subjects, are they objects, are they embodied, are they not? Um, it is through inference, but its meaningfulness reflects only upon what it refers to because the originating literal experience that contributes to meaning is not there. We fail to accord this absent referent its own existence. Um, so, invisible food animals, um, this is a, a drawing done by a former student. Um, I asked my students, draw a farm. What, what it, what's your vision or image of a farm? And um, I just thought I'd share a couple of these with you uh, as uh, we talk about media images on campus in our community. Um, so that's a farm for this student. And another one, um, what strikes me about a lot of these, um, and I've been collecting them, is uh, <clears throat> they're, you know, the animals are always outside, um, and they're often aerial perspectives, and the animals are, are uh, rendered, usually, not always, but they all kind of look alike, you know, like uh, manufactured widgets or something. Now, of course, I don't give my students, like, you know, uh, acrylic paint and paintbrushes and canvases and, and a month to work on this. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a, it's a good tool as a teacher. Um, how are you perceiving what we're talking about? When I say farm, what, what's, what's the farm in your mind? You know? um, and these all, <clears throat> these all come from advertising images on campus and in our community. The, um, is it Fresh Grocer, the grocery store, obviously, so be more. 
these are um, containers of milk, obviously, and it's interesting how the condition of the milking the milk cow is portrayed in these uh, as as a marketing strategy. Um, and so I put it next to my students' drawings because I, I started wondering, well, where are these images of, of, of farms coming from? And it can come from a grocery aisle where you have the benign, you know, the, 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 uh, the cow hanging out with the farmers there, the happy uh, milk cow <coughs> smiling, leaping for joy, and this pastoral uh, scene of some nostalgic farm that's never existed for us and somehow moves forward um, into our lives, um, despite the fact that it's, it's uh, inaccurate. And lunch trucks. Uh, I just walked around one day, and, or between classes actually, and, uh, and uh, took some pictures of uh, lunch trucks. And again, this is a way of making invisible. It doesn't really connect with Adam's notions of invisibility per se, but I think it's worth exploring and how you know, one approach is to hide the animal, another approach is to make it hyper-visible and um, render it as a cartoon image. So it's like this cultural artifact that has no connection to reality. Um, and oftentimes they're, they're, there's a whole, actually a great blog called uh, Suicide Food that you guys should check out if you haven't already, that collects these kind of um, twisted logic um, images. But here's one on, you know, on the temple truck side, chicken and rice, and the chicken smiling and, and anthropomorphized uh, as a human, like, hey, everything's all right here. Um, and there's another one, chicken heaven, um, which is both in terms of image and in language, I think, really disturbed and disturbing. Um, you know, uh, it, it's self-explanatory right here. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need to uh, explain the hell of chicken heaven. Um, so finally, you know, um, had to get the temple owl, obviously, uh, a very visible uh, and invisible animal on campus. But what can be done to make animals visible on campus and in our communities? Um, and I would say, too, I, I like the fact that we have an animal mascot. Uh, but again, it's a, this... Uh, heavily stylized image that's uh, not, not very accurate either. Um, and these are just some things that we, you know, maybe we could talk about. Um, I think as an educator myself, I'm very interested in interdisciplinary approaches, um, working across different disciplines, um, working, you know, I'm in the humanities, but working with people in the sciences, social sciences, uh, Community-based learning, I've done some of that as well, um, working with some of my students, uh, Hannah and Ashley, and, and um, have gone to Pennsylvania SPCA and, and done volunteer work. Um, I've had animals in the classroom. Actually, when I first had um, my uh, companion, Mazzy, in, in a classroom a few years ago, uh, I, I contacted a lawyer to make sure this was okay. And uh, she said, well, there's nothing on the books. Um, there's nothing in here about having an animal in the classroom. So there are you know, animals that can come in as assistant uh, animals. But um, so that, you know, and, that, and that's a way of making visible, too, and present, right? Because uh, I remember a student years ago saying, isn't it, you know, we were talking about human-animal relations. And he said, isn't it weird that we're talking about animals and there are no animals in this room? Now, obviously, we are animals too. They are within and without us. But um, to address theoretically and practically um, these issues of human-animal relations, and you know, it's it's it adds another level of difficulty. Um, you know, you're talking about race relations in the room, or something pertaining to human to human. Um, hopefully, there's some presentation there. There's representation. But with non-human animals in the classroom. Um, and so it opens up different types of rhetoric, different ways that we talk about animals when they're not listening. Um, <clears throat> humane education, I think, is very important. Um, and these are things that are becoming more and more common, um, and I really would advocate for. Activism, veganism, um, personally I feel as a moral baseline, um, you can do the greatest help by being vegan. 
um, for animals, and uh, local and regional groups getting connected with. Um, different groups, there's uh, promoters of animal welfare on campus, obviously TVAN, um, that, that engage the animal um, on their terms, too, and not, um, not just um, as their instrumental value, um, like a lab animal. And, uh, you know, talking about welfare philosophy versus rights philosophy, and then um, and just seeing and speaking, uh, representing animals. How, how do you tell their story? How can you? Um, and th these are important questions to ask, I think, as, as an animal advocate. How do we speak for animals? How do we make them visible? How do we make them present? Uh, one more hand on rent, just love her. Each time we talk about things that can be experienced only in privacy or intimacy, we bring them out into a sphere where they will assume a kind of reality which they never could have had before. Thanks. Right, I'm glad you brought that up because um, yeah, there, there are so many, so many dimensions to that, and and people. Um, I, I think I think the the commodification of animals with food and with you know leather and fur and so on, where the body is um, is torn apart, is uh, hidden within itself almost, um, which is a kind of paradoxical thing to think about, but um, encourages people to not think about, okay, what am I really looking at? What is this? And um, yeah, I'm glad you brought those up. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I think there's um, uh, denial is a powerful form of creating invisibility. Um, I think a lot of people know what goes on in the factory farms um, and in like fur factories, etc. Because I've had a number of people say, uh, I know what goes on, I don't want to talk about it. Right, right. They, they'll talk about their compassion, animals, but um, I think there's a really powerful whole and something really simple, and that's to that meat tastes good to those who eat it, or right. a fur coat is very aesthetic to those who wear it. And so I think there are those very basic, almost elemental uh, obstructions to um, creating not just a human-centric uh, compassion, uh, so, um, again, I think people generally know what goes on, and they choose, it's a willful denial. Uh, right, that's, that's an important point, and I, I, I often wonder if, <clears throat> if we had, uh, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. famous Paul McCartney quote, if, uh, if slaughterhouses had glass houses, no one would eat, uh, I hope I'm not just glass quoting, glass. Glass. Or glass walls, nobody would uh, eat, eat animals. Um, I just I disagree with that. I think I think they would, and it kind of connects with what you're saying about so many people are aware, and yet they make some kind of psychological maneuver that I would call a repression um, in order to uh, to not in engage that, and it's 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 um, encouraged uh, culturally. Institutionally, legally, you know, in these forms of invisibility, but it, it's uh, it's very easy to, to not to just turn away from it. Yeah. Um, I I would actually uh, disagree um, that uh, that that is the main reason why you know factory farming is perpetuated. Um, I'm the Philadelphia director for a uh, animal nonprofit called Humanely, and I've been the head school psychologist giving presentations about factory farming, uh, and every day I'm amazed that people don't know about factory farming. Uh, 
I go into classes and I would say about 49 of the 50 students have never heard of a factory farm. 49 of the 50 students have no idea what a battery page is or even seen an image of these battery pages. Uh, I, I do think that there are people, of course, that you know, like to ignore the situation um, and, and turn a blind eye, but I would say in the overall context of general society, I think it, it is I don't think it's uh, one of the main one. Um, a really quick example, I guess, going back to human-centered compassion or ethics. Um, I've been a long time leftist activist, so I interacted with people who are involved in anti-nuclear activism, feminism, uh, pro-immigrant, uh, pro-labor, uh, pro LGBT, and very few of them, I can't really mention even three who are leaders. And so there was this really vast uh, realm of compassion and circling in which these people devoted their lives. But animal rights and com true compassion to animals well, was not a part of yeah, I, I'm reminded, I went down to the Occupy <clears throat> movement at City Hall a few years ago, and um, I, I remember um, I went up to the kiosk to see what was going on and all the various groups and so forth, and then I went up to the information table, and because uh, I didn't see anything about animals, nothing. And I, I was there for a variety, and I'm, I'm invested in and interact with a lot of different causes, but I found, I found that a conspicuous absence, and I, and I went to the information, and they said, well, we have a, an environmentalist tent, and, but I don't know if they're going to be dealing with animal stuff or something. You know, so it does, you know, it, it goes back to the notion of a, of a, a species boundary, is that you know, humanism, at least in theory, is expanding to include more and more people, and, and, uh, and question what, what are the underlying foundations for, for, uh, for moral status. But when we come against a species wall, so many people aren't willing to you know, look over it and, and include that. Yeah, I was going to say, like, going off of that, like, even if people know about like, factory farming, just regardless of whether or not they know what it is or what goes on, or if they do, it's that separation between, well, they're animals, they're inferior to us, like, yeah. they don't matter as much as we do, like, they don't, some people don't think they experience pain. I mean, simple as things like that, so. I think that's like a huge part of it, the separation. Because I've gone into places I went to went to perform at one place, and it's like, oh, you know, like everything about this, and it's like, oh, this group and everything like that. But then you're putting this food here, and it's like got fish or something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on. Right. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, it's like you know, everybody gets involved in this. Just all, they're all just living creatures. And it's all just sort of like these little things that are whatever, little gradations of existence. Right. And that's all it really is. It actually works. I'm sorry? Well, it actually works to convert people. What's the most effective strategy? Um, I find that. So when I first became vegan, um, I really wanted my mom to go vegan as well. And like every time she ate, I would give a shit about what I was eating. And it's and not productive at all. And it took me a long time to realize that. And like you have to let people draw conclusions on their own and like, come to it on their own and, and make that connection between the animal and between what they're eating for them to, for them to
to me just, I don't know, I think going to Mercy Lounge with them and just being vegan, like, kind of quietly. Um, so, like, I'm not, I don't want to say anything, like, that, like offensive. And I don't really, like, talk about that much unless people ask me. Um, so, like, I'm going to go over to Trump and I'm going to and I'm kind of just invite the conversation until someone else has started. And then, yeah, and then the people that I live with have just seen that it's really easy. And I have kind of the same and less money than them. And I make mean, lunches food and then I like, share with them. And so that's, like, converted to people. And they stay vegan. And just say, I'm the whole story I've been vegan for six years. I started out. And I'm getting more not for money. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's um, some empirical data that supports what you guys are saying. Like you guys are talking anecdotally, um, but there's I'm in sociology, so I study these things, um, and I know that one prominent mechanism in social movements is modeling. Um, and so this is a mechanism that's been empirically documented in the context of veganism, but also in other social movements, and that is just performing the character um, in a way that's accessible to other people. Um, and someone mentioned significant others just a second ago, I think it was you, um, or roommates rather. Um, that's also key, like embedding people in social networks, like establishing a network like the Temple Vegan Action Network in which people can be lured in or establish some sort of connection um, or engage in like a brokerage type mechanism and bring people in and model the behavior. Um, and the other thing about veganism is that you need the network because people are more likely to go vegan gradually rather than abruptly. That is, most people don't go vegan overnight. Um, I know I was vegetarian for eight years, and then when I did go vegan, um, it took me three months. So it wasn't like I just went vegan one night. Um, I don't have like a vegan anniversary like other people when they post on Facebook and celebrate, yeah, this is my day, I went vegan on this day five years ago, I, I don't have that date. So, and this is just an anecdote, but what I'm saying is true of um, most people who go vegan. It happens um, gradually rather than abruptly, and there's empirical research to cite that. So, what you guys are saying are anecdotes, but it's right on the money in terms of a broader um, basis. Yeah, so um, just to reiterate, uh, positivity is definitely, like, that's the way to go. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to kind of regain that positivity. Um, and you know, one thing I suggest is uh, leafleting uh, can be a really good way um, to effectively uh, prepare the mission. Um, but also, in terms of what is going to make people vegan, uh, there's studies that have uh, gone on in the past year uh, relating to why people go vegan. And actually, it's about 50 50 um, people are going vegan for their health, and people are going vegan for the animals. Um, so, if we, uh, and people are not going vegan for the environment, it's just not happening. Um, so, if we want to you know, effectively uh, create more vegans in the world, we are going to effectively talk about health and talk about animals. Sure. I think, like, a, I think, um, it, and actually, I've seen data that shows that um, health is even more of a player than the ethics. But by ethics, I mean like animal rights. Um, but there is a threat when you promote veganism as a health thing of losing people as they are in that process. So I do think it's key to have like a multiple tiered discourse of like health and, and ethics. Um, and I think that's also key as to why we need networks, like not just give people the message, but you need some sort of established institution like TVAN that pulls people in, or the Peace Advocacy Network, if any of you are familiar with this, maybe you have heard of the Vegan Pledge. Um, so this is something that I wish they would do year-round. Um, not do a pledge year-round, that'd be kind of crazy, but have some sort of informal network that goes on beyond the 30 days that they do it for. Because people basically show up um, for five gatherings, they're assigned a mentor, they're assigned, not assigned, um, they're provided with resources, and basically they're embedded in this network for 30 days. And then some of these people, like Dan's wife, who's a um, great right, partner, who's, um, I should make assumptions. It's your wife, right? Okay. Um, Dan's wife, Rachel, who's the best vegan advocate in the world. She um, is a mentor, so she maintains a relationship with people that she's mentored um, over the years. So that's an example of like some sort of network, some sort of tie. So I think it can get at some of the problems that can come up if you just say, go vegan for health reasons, because odds are they could let it go. I mean, there's nothing unhealthy about wearing leather. Okay, I, I just have like a question. Um, well, I know like the loft in Morgan Hall has like vegan cookies and brownies, and they're really good. And I'm not, I don't understand what the difference between a vegan and a vegetarian is, or even what a vegan is. Or what vegan yeah, is. that's a great. I don't know. Uh, well, a vegan doesn't, a vegan, it's a, a holistic approach in the sense that you don't use animals at all, uh, you don't eat them, you don't. 
I mean, I should start by saying there are different ways people define vegan. Um, but uh, it, it's, for me, it's a principle of uh, uh, primum non nocere, first do no harm. Um, and uh, not only not eating animals, not eating their byproducts, but as a vegetarian, uh, there are different types of vegetarian too. Um, but in a general sense, they just don't eat animals, but they'll eat their byproducts like milk and, and, and uh, cheese and so on. Um, and, you know, I guess, I don't know if somebody would be defined a vegan if they wore, I, I, would, I wouldn't consider them a vegan if they wore animals. Uh, Real animals or, or fake animals? Uh, what's that? Like fake animal skin? Yeah, like, I mean, like my shoes and my belt are, uh, are synthetic. They're, they're, uh, I like them. <laughs> they're vegan shoes. Um, also, in, in terms of uh, entertainment, too, we have a friend who um, uh, every year she asks us if we want to come over and, and drink with her and watch a Kentucky Derby. You no. Know? <laughs> Likewise, you know, or go, go to the circus or, you know, uh, I view that as, as exploiting animals. And so, not, not participating. Uh, is, is sending a, it's a political message too, saying I'm not, I'm not endorsing this, I'm not being present to it, I'm not um, funding it. Hopefully that yeah, kind of helps. Yeah, there are probably other elements that I've missed, but. Uh, you know, I think, uh, of course, one of the breakdowns is vegan is a diet and ethical vegans, mm -hmm. um, yeah, which I consider myself. But I think, you know, it's funky problem, uh, meatless Mondays, et cetera, uh, inter you know, interacting uh, on an approachable level with relatives, friends, whatever. But I think, you know, certainly another avenue um, is to, since we're in a university, is to bring it into the universities. And so, uh, you I understand teach English. And so that's going to influence some of your message. Sure. You know, the way that you interact with students. Certainly. If my students want an A, they have to go to sociology. <laughs> but, you know, to break down the separation between there's humans and then there's animals. Instead of the human animal and the non Right. So to break down that barrier, um, and to make compassion universal. Uh, so, you know, and there's other ways to do that too, you know, medical research. Uh, have a class on what are alternatives to using research. Right. What are European models? You know? so, so I guess what I'm saying, to use whatever avenue, when people are in the midst of learning English, Introduce them to new concepts that uh, that uh, build different perspectives about other animals. Right, and I, I um, just the other day actually I was conferencing with a, one of my students in the courtyard around the corner, and um, uh, he was arguing in his essay that it's ethical to <coughs> to uh, to eat animals. Uh, at the same time, he was so enthralled by this little squirrel running around taking french fries out of a person's hand. And, and I think, not all people obviously, but I think a lot of people, it, it transcends cultural differences and such, that there is a connection with animals or, or an intrigue, an interest. Um, even if it's a, a sense of mystery or why is that animal doing such and such out of a, a place of ignorance. But curiosity too, and th th that's why talking about visibility, it, it's so dangerous when animals become more and more invisible. Um, to try to cultivate that in people and encourage paying attention, and uh, to not just to the human but to the to the animal. I think one issue with spreading veganism is probably.
really an issue that you face with any other kind of activism. So where people will see something and they can have a stance on it more, like, like know that something is wrong and then still not take action because it's not convenient or whatever. I was just thinking about, remember the Coney video that went around? Everybody saw that and everybody <coughs> thought it was wrong and cried when they saw it and then didn't do anything about it. And I think a lot of the time people will see like slaughterhouse footage and stuff and know it's wrong, but then just not take action. And I don't understand why. Well, that's a, uh, and then Rachel, oh, that's great. But uh, w that's a dimension that I didn't address that, that's really complicated, I think, is, um, you know, witnessing uh, these films, especially as an animal advocate, I've seen a lot of these films. Um, it hurts every time I watch them. And, you know, sometimes I, I show them in classes, uh, more moderate ones, I, I would say. But, um, but I think to myself, I know this already, I've seen this already, do I have any ethical responsibility for watching it again? And I think there's something to be said about uh, putting the image before you again to remind yourself of just what is at stake, you know. And, um, but then I, I wonder too, can, can you become desensitized where you're, you're constantly exposed and you just sort of shut down? I think it's really difficult to see it from like our perspective as vegans because we have like a predisposition to like to think about it in a certain way because we already have made that connection. So it's like difficult to think about. So I would offer two reasons. Um, one is, uh, so I work with the Indian League and we have a lot of people who are all around the city uh, working with uh, on a Regal Monday initiative through city council, et cetera. Um, but I also think, uh, you know, Animal activists affiliate the group resource. I think that we as vegans, you know, if the, if we have any sort of impulse to, you know, really do something about it, there are volunteer opportunities right and left. There are there, there's a lot of stuff to be done about uh, animal activism. So I definitely urge you to get involved in that. Do you find that a lot of the show uh, that you speak to end up like becoming vegetarian? Oh yeah. Or, yeah. I'm really intrigued by the first point you made, though, on how like um, people will seem to care about these issues but don't do anything about it. Um, and there's, I don't mean to sound like a sociologist, but like there's a lot of research that shows um, that there are basic biographical factors that prevent people from doing these things. And when I say prevent, I don't mean there's any like social force preventing them, it's just that they choose not to do it. So they have some agency. Um, but for example, some people are very active in social movements, um, but then they have a baby and they're no longer active. Um, and that's what I mean by biographical factor. There are all these like structural circumstances that emerge that prevent people from doing these things. Um, even something like veganism, which is like a cultural movement, I guess, more than just a social movement. Um, one issue I have, um, and I think this could be a solution, is um, how veganism tends to be perceived, and I think that this is fair, as a movement of privilege. That is a movement that tends to target people who are white, um, well-educated, um, upper class, upper middle class, middle class. And I think one of the reasons why that perception is prevailing is because it's true. Um, I think that one reason why um, we have this issue is based on the way we do activism. So I, um, I recently read this essay um, on veganism, and the author used the term conscious harmlessness. Um, the author was Laylee Phillips, who has since changed her name to Laylee Mepa Ryan. She's a scholar at um, a school in Massachusetts. And what I like about that term is that um, conscious harmlessness suggests that veganism is an act, not a standard. So I think we should have standards, like I'm not going to consume honey or dairy milk or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that I can't further advance my veganism if I define it as conscious harmlessness. So um, one example is um, bottled water. I was recently consuming, purchasing bottled water on a regular basis. But then a friend of mine sent me an article that showed me how environmentally destructive bottled water was, so I stopped doing it. I had a choice. I could either maximize my conscious harmlessness, or I could continue to consciously harm the environment by buying bottled water. So I chose not to anymore. And that, for me, was an example of advancing my conscious harmlessness. So I think that if we just look at it as like a reflexive project um, in which we're ignorant, 
And that doesn't mean we're bad people. It just means that we're inevitably ignorant. We need to keep working and keep ambushing ourselves in some way. We can keep pushing our veganism forward, even if we're already vegan as you and I would define it. Um, but I think what's key about that is that you can then connect veganism to other forms of oppression, like racism and sexism and homophobia and transphobia and ableism and ageism, all these isms. And I think if you do that, you can create a more effective movement. Because then you draw on people who are interested in these other issues, like immigrant rights, like racism, like sexism. And the way I see it is it's all one matrix of domination, like Patricia Collins would say. So I think it's hard because like, uh, when I go and protest the circus, um, I need to obviously have some sort of single issue to do that event. But at the same time, when I'm there, I'm not just resisting the enslavement of those animals, I'm resisting domination overall. So I think that is, there needs to be some sort of tension between like, being a single issue movement and then resisting domination overall. And I think that's a way to get people more involved. Yeah, and there's been a, there's a split between, um, not to get too abstruse with all that, but there's um, academically, you know, human animal studies, which is, is uh, I would characterize as more academic, but um, not, there's not the, the activism dim dimension. And it tends to not be as interdisciplinary, whereas critical animal studies uh, fosters and encourages that kind of uh, activism connected with scholarship and interdisciplinary and, and so that you're constantly looking at different uh, interfaces of oppression and exploitation versus it being just one single uh, single issue. Uh, yes. It ends up being kind of because you realize that you know negativity and guilting someone into being vegan isn't really the right way to go. I learned that the hard way, <laughs> but um, I think that like me also just having a more positive attitude and like confidence in what in my lifestyle, um, and then just like kind of like making me nice and eaters for a while actually helped me um, in the long run because now I actually can accept accept where they're coming from because I think um, if you were saying that we have this kind of predisposition, but probably for the most of us we didn't always we didn't start out vegan. So we also still have that sympathy for, you know, the change in, in paradigm kind of like a shift in your brain that happens. So what I found most successful too is because um, like when I first went vegan, the reason I kind of resisted for a while is because all my friends were like, just go vegan, just go vegan, just do it. And I was like, I'm not gonna do something because you're telling me to do it. And so then I did research on my own and like found a bunch of books. And so I recommend those books to people that I can tell are probably just pushing up against me because they don't want to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, also like having a positive, like glowing attitude about it, um, it's also just more attractive and people will want to emulate that and be like that and kind of like it's just like spreading the not to be like all yogi about it, but like spreading the like the glow of conscious art. various animal rights things, I do a cooking show, and I do various animal rights issues in these shows. Mm. And it's funny because it's like, I did the swap one thing, it was the, the puppet revolution. You know, I did, a, I did an open microphone down there, and one of the songs, that was way back when they were talking about that, Blackfish, that movie Blackfish, Blackfish. Right. one of the songs I did was Message in the Bottle, and it turned out that it, it bit those people now, it was, I was doing about the whale. But it turned out it fit those people there perfectly. Because they were these marginalized people. It's like, oh, the puppets, we, we don't want puppets, we want poets, we want dancers, we want puppets. Are, oh, they're, oh, they're fine. Now, this little kid is nothing. Right. Which doesn't always work. But, you know, like, and it turned out it was, I mean, it's, it's happened over and over. It's actually something I think quite a lot about. Yeah, I mean, there's so many opportunities to to talk to people about human-animal relations and, and the ethical dimensions of how we interact with them. Um, I mean, I and and again with the with the invisibility, that's um, a grand difficulty, and um, that the exploited subject is not speaking to us, speaking for for him or herself. But um, but I, yeah, I think. 
it intersects in my life as a teacher, a writer, a scholar, an activist. Um, is, um, and, and I'm always trying to have conversations with people and, and see where they're coming from, too. And I'm fascinated with, uh, even if I don't agree with their, their ethical position, I'm really fascinated. Like, well, why are you this way? How, how did that happen? Well, also their culture sometimes. You know, like, they might be, I was in a place for one time, you know, like this big thing, you know, like with all these disabled people, you know, and it's like, I said, can you give me some vegan food? And it's like, yeah, we'll give you pizza. And yeah, I said, because I've known the times when I stopped eating milk because I had allergic reactions. You know, and it's like, but, you know, you're going to get pizza because these people just don't, either don't get it or it's like they have this culture where it's supposed to be that you have to put up with this or, you know, like, and it's like, well, the whole thing is like, you know, why, why don't you have some turkey or something like that, you know? Right. Yeah. right. Uh, I think there are a couple other influences. Um, one is uh, capitalism and the other is religion. Um, and there's a commonality there. I was doing an anti fur protest once, and this passerby came up, and he um, quoted the Bible, Genesis, Dominion over the earth. Um, I just, um, a couple weeks ago, was helping out uh, a campaign to get rid of gestation uh, cages uh, for pigs in the river. And doing research on that, and they quoted an Iowa farmer that said, you know, we have to remember that we're dealing with a, a product. And I guess my point is that we treat, and it's not just the society, this is where I live, so, um, but we treat uh, animals, not human animals, like we treat the environment. It, it comes down to a product. Uh, yeah, it's a resource. It comes so. down to dominion over, you know, fracking or whatever. It's, you know, it's that dominion or product or mentality that I think is one of the, one of the uh, obstructions to progressing. Uh, uh, in our relationship with other animals. Yeah, and when I'm, uh, when I'm teaching courses where we get into the ethics of animals, um, I think the most common thing I hear is, I think uh, eating animals is ethical so long as it's done humanely, or as long as they're treated well. Something along that line. I mean, that's a paraphrase. But, so, there's a, there's a disconnect there, um, but in some ways I wonder where that's coming from and if maybe it's partly that dominion notion too, that we're somehow custodians and these are the appointed natural or divinely given processes that, you know, this, this is, it's okay to do this, but we must be um, compassionate as we do it or, or something. I think the attitude that it's okay to eat uh, meat as long as it's slaughtered humanely is like a big part of the problem. I guess it's that like welfareish attitude that like, and uh, Peter Singer actually talks about this a little, and he even says like he even questions whether or not it's actually morally wrong to eat meat as long as it was humanely slaughtered, which I thought was kind of counterproductive. But then on the other end, it. Um, if you're really strict with that stuff and um, more like an abolitionist vegan, then I feel like that turns off a lot of people and they will be as an extremist. So Why not like identify the standard being veganism and then foster someone's gradual transition? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like recognize them as like taking certain steps. Like, okay, well done, you replaced dairy milk with almond milk. Like to me, that's a step. Um, I, I could even stretch you know, meatless Mondays a little bit to vegan stuff. Like, if you're going to shoot meat eating one day a week, great. 
but then don't like take on like a static state, like keep moving forward. Um, and if you have someone in like a network, or when I say network, it could be like a basic social tie, like a girlfriend or um, like a significant other or a you know family member, whatever. Um, just foster that transition. So I think you could be an abolitionist that still um, advocates incremental <laughs> advocacy. I guess. And of course, like anything that someone does, like any small change they make, does help. Yes. It's just a matter of working that lines of um, I was just thinking about it from like a global perspective and how realistic it would be to, you know, expect the entire world to go vegan. And also, um, you know, some of the difficulties of like traveling and, and trying to, and, you know, expecting um, you know, to be accommodated. Um, so just kind of curious about what you guys think of that. It's a, it's a good question. I'll just uh, admit, and you guys might want to jump in too. Um, I, I, I mean, I believe that, uh, I mentioned Primo Non Nocere, First Do Not Harm, um, is, is an important idea to me. I, I would argue that to live is, it is impossible to live without causing suffering, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, but I feel that being vegan and not exploiting animals um, in, in ways that I'm conscious of, that's very doable. That's, uh, that's an easy step, um, you know, it, but you do get into these conversations sometimes with people that, oh, do you kill mosquitoes or do you drive on tires that, you know, tires are not vegan and th things of that nature. I mean, I, th I think that kind of, it's an important question, it's an important conversation, but um, I don't know, I think, I think there's so many, so like, you know, going back to the notion of steps, other steps that could be taken. Instead, when a person does that, they're kind of like trying to s slide things to this absolute uh, end of things. But, um, I, Rachel? Yeah, yeah, so I, uh, this is a question that comes up a lot um, in the classes. Um, and uh, something I usually encounter with is, um, you know, We're not, we're not exactly thinking that the world's going to go vegan overnight. Uh, it's just not, that's not how social movements have worked in the past. Um, and I think that uh, having this hypothetical, you know, what's the world going to do if it goes vegan, I, I honestly don't even think it's, it's worth our time to question uh, because we're not at that stage yet. We're not at the, oh, 50% of the world is vegan. That's awesome. How are we going to get the rest of the things? We're at the less than 1%. Uh, so I think that, you know, we can maybe have less discussion down the line, but I think that we don't really need to like really talk about it. It's just not something that we can discuss. Yeah, I was just really excited to ask you too about traveling and like starting to be nominated. I kind of, I've been traveling for full, I've traveled for like nine months, so like I just never had a month ago. And I was in a lot of different places. And I never let, my value be compromised by the fact that I was traveling. There's a lot of people that I asked by that time that they used to be vegetarian and even like start eating meat there because they didn't think they'd be able to make it as a vegan as there. But um, I think that like being accommodated is such like a that's like a privileged word, you know? So there are certain things, there are certain things you don't want to say in other cultures that might be offensive that you might need to be true. Um, and just like But I think that also, one, on a fun note, you'll be surprised at like how many awesome, different, and even sometimes cheap products there are around the world. Um, there's a lot of really cool European products, and even in Africa, the soya mints is way cheaper, and like, so, like a lot of meat places are way cheaper than meat is there. So, um, like in, in more developed areas. So, I think it's definitely possible, and I'm excited to try to like, find places, and happy to have a really great resource for that. But, um, as far as the ethics and like philosophy behind my lifestyle is concerned, it's like not about personal purity for me. 
And so for me, it's like more effective to be a vegan advocate and, and make it not about, um, like, oh, is there like a trace amount of milk in this like hot dog bun or something? And so I'm like, I don't make my neighbors like hose down their grill when they invite me over, you know? I'm like, I can just scrape off your grill and throw my vegetables on. Like, I try to make it like, I don't need to be accommodated, you know? I can, I can be responsible for my own lifestyle and I can like bring food to share with everyone else and show everyone how to do this. Yeah, there's a Karen Davis who, um, who runs United Poultry Concerns has this great essay called "The Apology of or the Rhetoric of Apology in uh, Animal Rights Movement," where she talks about uh, how how much apologizing there is within this social movement versus other uh, social movements. It's a great read, um, um, and among other things, she's she's saying that. You know, we need to stop doing all this apologizing um, and worrying that you're, you know, to accommodate. Oh, I'm sorry to 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 uh, dis <laughs> make you uncomfortable or something. I actually did did that in um, years ago when I, had, I I went from vegetarian back to omnivore to back to vegetarian. I've had a, a strange travel, but now I'm vegan. But um, uh, when I, a few years into being vegetarian, I. I did a road trip in Mexico for, for a month or so. And uh, I felt like I'd be disrespecting the people I stayed with. And I ate uh, iguana, grasshoppers, um, dove, uh, and, and all kinds of other animals. And I, to this day, I really regret doing that. Um, I didn't feel comfortable enough to assert my, you know, I, I wouldn't have compromised other beliefs, right? You know, I should have articulated that. Um, so I commend you, Ashley, for, <laughs> for your approach and your travel. No, I agree with the not being sorry about saying so. Whenever people have tried to make me like, oh, well, it's not a vegan on the street, it's like bust or whatever. It's like, no, I can actually, like, I can speak to the curator in their own, like, native language the best I can. Right. And I tell them that I don't eat this or that. Like, it doesn't, you don't have to make me feel bad for trying to do something to not harm anyone else. You know what I mean? So. There have been times that are a bit frustrating. And sometimes you do end up with salad and bread or something. But there's always, I mean, I've always found ways to like make it an enjoyable experience and make a conversation out of it. And of course, like, it's exhausting sometimes. But I think that's like all part of the journey. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think one thing uh, to talk about is the environmental impact. Um, I guess uh, the question occurred to me for a moment. So. Um, it'd be a really good thing if a lot more of the world uh, uh, were vegan, were depleting the oceans, uh, and the you know, wastelands that are being created through you know, manure uh, wash offs and, and the factory farms, etc. So there are real environmental um, uh, benefits to uh, vegans. And the other point um, is I was um, vegetarian for about 30 years. And it took me viewing some of the films that you referred to, which kind of shocked me into being a vegan. It just never connected. And the fear I had was, I really love pizza. How am I going to have a vegan pizza? You know? But then I, I found out, well, you can have pizza without, say, without cheese. You know? How am I going to get chocolate? You know? um, so I looked for really good dark chocolate. You know? So I think you, a part of a way to integrate is to honor, if you will, um, the foods that people like. You know, because I think a lot of people see veganism as this exotic thing. You know, oh, I could never do that. Right. But to make it approachable, you know, to introduce them, people to alter, alternatives. I 
think that's definitely a big part when you're transitioning to veganism, especially baked meats and baked cheeses and stuff like that. And then after a while, your taste buds kind of gradually change. I like so many different kinds of foods now that I never would have even tried before, which is generally a good thing. Um, um, but as far as traveling goes, um, a piece of like practical advice, um, telling people you're allergic works a lot better than trying to explain your vegan, which isn't like the best for um, if you're trying to make people understand your lifestyle. But if you're at a restaurant and you don't speak the language and you tell them you're like that you're allergic, they won't put it in. If you tell them that you're, that you're a vegan or try to explain it, like they'll chop it up small so you can't see it. And yeah, it becomes a legal issue. Honestly, same goes, uh, yeah, same goes for restaurants in America. Like, I used to work at a restaurant where if someone said they were vegetarian, like, they put it on there anyway and take it off and do all kinds of stuff. If someone says they're allergic to something, you can't use the same knives, you can't use the same like trays. So generally it's better to say you're allergic. For, for I just have one, one more thought that I'm going to try not to talk about, but about the, uh, this kind of like environmental issue also humanitarian issue, I think, and so I, I agree with you, I hear a lot of the same arguments, like, why are you worried about animals when so many humans are suffering, and the research I do is, like, surrounding food insecurity, and actually, I think a lot of you probably know this, but, you know, what I always tell people is, it takes 16 pounds of grain to produce one pound of meat, so every time you're eating a plate of meat, you're throwing 16 plates of pasta, or whatever grain you want, to feed other people in the way, so that actually is, like, not only really harmful to the environment because of you know, like methane gas emissions and, and all of the like mechanisms of capital that goes into it, but also just the amount of waste uh, like of energy and, and obviously of the suffering that is unnecessary. So I just kind of see it as a overall like positive thing to not be Yeah, there's so many fronts where you could address uh, the ethics of being a vegan, how, how helpful it is. Uh, for the environment, for your personal health, for for animals. It's, yeah. And who are those people too? Right. And who are those people? Yeah. I mean, they take you, if you go like to the southeast of this country, where like the majority of like you know some of these I guess the chicken, it's, it's undocumented immigrants, yeah. um, which is another population rendered invisible. But that's also true for produce, though. There's a lot of okay. yeah. So there's problems there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, used to be mental patients. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I understand you're saying, but I would never go into a restaurant and say that I'm allergic. I would say, and I've done this, and it's been some of my best moments. And when there's nothing on the menu that I'm willing to eat, I'll say to the waiter, there's nothing on the menu that I'm willing to eat. Can you ask the chef to make something for me? I don't care what it is. Make it, charge me a fair price, it's fine. And I mean that sincerely. You know, I'm not going to send it back, boil some pasta, throw some, whatever you need to do. <laughs> and uh, they'll do it. And, you know, it, it creates the, it gets the message out. It, it lets them know that we're there. And like you were just saying, if I understood correctly, uh, the more we do that, the more likely it is that there, or, that there is eventually going to be a vegetarian or a vegan section on the menu. Right. And, you know, the, that means, you know, now we have a vegan truck on campus. We didn't have that as recently as a year ago, two years ago. So, you know, things do move as a result of that. Where is the vegan truck? Uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> who, who it's, like, it's, it's 13th Street. Um, it's right here. Yeah, it's a block. Yeah, right. It's literally yeah, right, right there. Yeah, it's oh right. my god. Yeah, you walk past the library and it's. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, I've, I've, I've always been looking for it. I just can't find it. I thought it was a mess. Vegan tree. Yeah, vegan tree. The name of the truck is vegan? Yeah. Who's the tree? Yeah. 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 It's Yeah. There was a story about them in the student newspaper, either the most recent issue or the one before, where they interviewed the people who were in the most recent one. The most recent one. The most recent one. The most recent one between, like, right, or just like the people over there. Okay. So it's like me, Haley, go left, and it's in between, like, I guess, Barton and Fury. Um, like, you know where the beach is? You're yeah. on the beach, looking away from the library, it should be there. Okay. It's off. Awesome. Can I ask the last question? Sure. Okay, because we're running out of time. Um, so you mentioned capitalism as did um, Rich earlier, um, and you know I'm curious to know what you all think of this. In addition to Dan, but I'll start with Dan. Um, I I guess I see uh, the invisibility of um, other animals and also of other humans, like undocumented immigrants, for example, as being rooted in economic interests, um, and. When I say economic interest, I don't mean it in the broadest sense, like obviously economics is not just money, it's like meeting our needs, so I guess in some sense economics is inevitable. Um, but I mean like money, like financial capital, not even social capital, like financial capital, like I see that as a root of this invisibility. Um, and we need financial capital because we live in a capitalist society and we need to compete to survive. So um, is corporate capitalism compatible with animal rights? And what do you all think of capitalism? Are you all blatantly anti-capitalist like I am? Or are there people that are different? I mean, is there a, a compatibility issue here? Um, I think capitalism can perpetuate the ideas that animals are property. But if you look at, um, like you can look at the way of, of large farm use cows and you see them as property, as capital, but then at the same time, you look at someone's dog, and I guess that's also their property, but they view it very differently. They view it as, I guess, more valuable to them. So it's like, that's still their property, but they view it as a being rather than a piece of capital. You know? And I, and I think that- But does that dog have rights? Because the dog is technically still owned. Yeah, I mean, and I, I realize that maybe dogs and cats are an exception because, you know, as humans, we've overbred them to an extent where we have, like, you know, stray cats. Like, in my neighborhood, they're everywhere. Um, so I guess, like, I brought in two cats. So, I mean, I guess I'm guilty of depriving them of their rights. Like, right now, they'd probably rather be outside than stuck in my house. But um, I'm just wondering if that's an exception. They're still owned, but, right. but it changes the owner's mindset as in the nature of the animal and seeing it as an animal rather than rather than a resource. Um, well, the country is going through a, a health short phase. Of, you know, everything is the bottom line. Everything is privatized. It's very much we're at a, a, a vast societal business model. Capitalism is a law. What counts in capitalism is, is profit. And I think, so things like, you know, uh, are animals property? That's like saying, is philosophy or humanity relevant to the bottom line? 
it really has nothing to do with capitalism per se. What capitalism, and this is my opinion, capitalism is all about profit and a lot of money. So if you make uh, veganism profitable, and that doesn't mean that it becomes the predominant market. Uh, but if you make something you know, veganism profitable, right, a lot of people will start going to a restaurant you know, because, as you say, you've introduced the concept of uh, preparing a vegan dish. And you do more of that, and more customers show up. It's going to be profitable for that restaurant. Right. So what I'm saying is, if you make it profitable, um, then you can turn it uh, more regularly toward the vegan But to have any kind of profit, you need to exploit someone else. Oh, yeah. You need but to exploit other humans. So, I mean, vegans are becoming profitable. I don't know how I feel about that either. I think it's actually an oxymoron a little bit. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, you, I feel like the whole profit aim mindset is restrictive towards rights, any people's rights, animals, people, the environment. And how can you, I mean, you were saying, like, how can you have a profit aimed goal and also include the rights of other beings? I mean, I'm just, like, studying um, herbalism right now. And, you know, foraging and things like that. And how can you, if you want for, if, you, if foraging were to become a business, then we would exploit the plant world, as we have many times, but it would become an industry. So if you're, I mean, animals as an industry are just exploited by nature. So like the profit-based capital mindset, I don't think it's compatible with like welfare for any animal or being. I think the mindset-driven thing is just there's not room for both. That's just my gut feeling. And of course, this happens with humans too. I mean, I think yeah. when, I mean, I, when I see like people starving to death, I I attribute that to capitalism. We have a competition. We have horrible social inequality. Yeah. This country, you know, around the world, um, and that, so I see the privatization as being conducive to that inequality. I guess. Ash. It's not an ethical philosophy. It's a profit-based, you know, as, as other people have pointed out. Um, but um, I think uh, I'll come back. 
triggered my memory. I, now I remember what I was going to say. Um, but talking, talking about connection, I think that's something in animal advocacy that, that we need to see more of is interdisciplinary work, drawing on uh, different social movements and, and interfacing, um, you know, looking at things as, as connected, um, and, and including economic theory. I think that's, that's so important. Um, I don't really see much of a critique of that so far. Maybe it's because of the field I'm in, or I'm just not privy to, to what, what, what economic theory is out there right now. But that seems to be something that's lacking.